So this is another scene, you know, that was really just fresh air, and then with the scene that Michael wrote, and then get, getting the voices to bring it to life, and then hand it over to, you know, to the animators to uh, to do their work. So having said that, we did all the exterior boat stuff, you know, in the outside where you had the wind and you had clouds and sun and rain, all the stuff that now follows, which is really this large battle, this was all done on a stage. So the history of the boat was that it was built on stages in, in Queensland, and it was built like a jigsaw all put together, and then it was dismantled, put onto trucks, um, and shipped up about, I don't know, 60 miles up the Queensland coast, put together with its head and its tail, 100 tons of it. We spent a month shooting all the exterior scenes, as I said, in the wind and the rain, etc. And then it was dismantled, brought back onto the stage, and here you see it on the stage. Um, the stage wasn't big enough. We couldn't have the head or the tail. We just had the main body of it, and these other things were added later. And there, it was all surrounded by green screen because, you know, we had to put in all this mist afterwards and whatever. And, you know, we shot this whole thing. It was very, very strange because there's nothing there. These people were acting, these actors were on stage imagining all this, us talking them through it. That's here right. comes the green That's mitch. Right. This is, you're all having your nightmares here. And, you know, it was full of machinery, the stage, because when you see the battle, you'll see there's water flying all over the place. It was, you know, you really have to be focused as an actor to, to work in this way when there is nothing around you. My hat's off to them because it, it, you're absolutely right. They're in a vacuum, and they may be in the middle of a very dramatic scene, and yet they have very little to react to or act with. And yet we had we had some wonderful, wonderful actors who, from the small parts to the big parts, yeah. very much got in the spirit of things and understood what they had to do. This was a great afterthought, I remember. And our editor, Rick Shane, who made a big contribution to this, had the idea of why don't we have his father talking to him Originally, we had someone, a, a character from Miraz who had killed his father, a character from Caspian Miraz. So why don't we bring the father in? So the mm -hmm. father had never been seen, so we had free reign to do whatever we want with it. But I think it was a good idea. And we, we wanted to make sure that, that Caspian's issue really had to do with his father. Yeah. And we see when we get to Aslan's country at the end, there is a question about whether or not he will join his father. Yeah, and to, to just give that... F that person just a moment of recognition, you know, so you mm -hmm. knew who he was. But I remember we spent a lot of time in pre-production doing tests on the boat, not with the actors, but with, you know, other people of all the levels of mist and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then Angus came around our production, uh, you know, visual effects supervisor said, no, 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 we can't have any mist on at all because we have to put the mist on afterwards, the different levels of mist. And then when we had the news that we had to go into 3D as well, that became even more important because, you know, if you have a lot of mist on, it's very difficult then to, to, to convert stuff in 3D. So there was no mist around at all on any of this stuff. You know, speaking of the 3D, we were so fortunate that we had um, almost a year to work on the 3D and... and to the effect that, that we knew that we were doing 3D before we did a single visual effects shot. So we were able to do all of those in 3D. Yeah. And uh, it was um, not in any way a conventional conversion, but it was something that was really envisioned very early on as a 3D film, and, and yeah. we were able to include it. I was pleased with it. I mean, uh, you know, I'd never done 3D. Um, I, don't, I don't think you had either. Never, and, never. You know, I, you know, 3D is the thing that happens last, and you look at it, and I thought it was good. I thought we didn't grandstand it. You don't have the audience ducking and diving in the auditorium, but I thought it made you feel more in it than you do with 2D. You've got a sense of being in a space with these actors. That's, it, that's I think, the success of our 3D. It really gives dimension to the film. It gives a real depth to it, and you somehow feel that it's more more complete. Um, um, I will never forget our premiere in London when the Queen of England herself had her 3D glasses on watching the film. Yeah, no, that, was a, that was a great moment, great moment for us all. 
But, uh, you know, it, it was a strange experience converting into 3D because, you know, you have to look at each scene and decide where to put people in, in the third dimension, how far back you want them. Do you want the actors in the front of the frame to be sitting in the audience's laps? And mm -hmm. you have to make mm -hmm. those decisions, which is, you know, kind of hard work. So this, this next image, you know, that's coming up now, of course, was incredibly difficult and important decision. This, what is the sea serpent that we've been waiting to see? The real manifestation of evil, what's it gonna look like? And, you know, we had some, you know, that was, it proved to be difficult because we sort of changed our minds halfway through. That's right. I mean, it really is a trial and error process. And um, sometimes we, we went a little bit too far with the um, sea serpent, and uh, other times we, we don't think that it had enough of its own character. But it's so remarkable. This the scene right now is dealing with three... Uh, imaginary characters, three visual effects characters, Reaper Cheap, uh, Eustace as a dragon, and the sea serpent, and yet they're very much integrated into a real live action yeah, film. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, you wanted the sea serpent to be original, and when we started to see our first renditions of it, then we thought, people said, oh my lord, have you seen Clash of the Titans? There's something rather like it in that. So we thought, mm -hmm. we can't do that. So we right. had to go back to the drawing board, which is, you know, f for something as big as this was, uh, you know, a kind of bold decision. And then, again, the decision of how ugly to make it. Do you, you don't want to frighten people to death, and yet you've got to make it threatening. You, I mean, we've been waiting. This is the, the big action sequence in the film, and so you've got to deliver something kind of that's exciting right. and tough and dangerous and all that. So it's always, you know, checks and balances. But the, just the challenge alone, how many... Uh how many dragons have we seen before and how many sea serpents yeah. have we seen? So how do you make them both original but make sense for, for your particular film and yeah. give them character and, um, and, and you know, be, be interested in and of themselves? Yeah, and, you know, there's a certain, almost a certain formula, so you can't go way off that formula. So you've got mm -hmm. to, you know, th there has to be something recognizable about them, but yet it's got to be, you know, it's got to be different and, and original within certain parameters. Now, you can imagine what this was like to shoot. You know, we had, this is where on, on the stage, uh, the, the boat that was on the stage had a much bigger gimbal. And, you know, it was really pretty alarming. And people were being thrown around and, you know, there was no stunt doubles here. The, the, you know, Georgie and, and Skander and Will, they were doing it. Well, not Will, he's a dragon, but right. uh, they were doing this stuff. and. Yeah, they and they and they wanted to do it. Yeah, they wanted to yeah. do it um, themselves. And yeah. um, you know, as always, you have to make a decision: what's safe, what's not safe. And we had a great um, uh, stunt crew who, yeah. who made sure that they were all wired. For instance, when uh, when right here, when um, when um, uh, Edmund swings uh, swings up, um, goes over the into the mast, and swings mm -hmm. onto the sails, yeah. we we had him tethered. But nevertheless, it was a it's a dangerous stunt. Yeah, and and this too, I mean, being stuck in the mouth, it was right. was tricky. But again, you know, I was worried. You know, would it's important that we got a rating from the film? You know, that would allow the biggest audience to see it. And you know, was the you know was is the sea serpent too violent? And you know, in different countries, we've got different response. In, in America and the United Kingdom, we've got, you know, a PG rating. But in other European countries like Germany, they, they wanted it was too much for them, and so we had to shorten some of the, the sequence to deal with that. So, mm -hmm. you know, but... Uh, it's again, really a question, it really is a question of intensity, I yeah, think. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's not individual shots. It's, it's the whole thing, and I remember seeing it, you know, with a young audience, and I was, you know, worried that some of them would come roaring out of the place, but they didn't. They took it all in. And this this scene is a very interesting. It's a wonderful, wonderful moment that we've taken. I think really the filmic version of what's in the book, because in this transformation scene in the book, it's related by Eustace after the fact. We don't. We're not even there. He tells us what happened, and that he he basically scratched his own skin off. And I think w with Ashlyn being there, and in this particular case, we have Ashlyn scratching at the sand, helping Eustace um, 
um, become a boy again, and I think it's a really wonderful yeah, no, uh, film interpretation. I'll, I'll of never a, forget it. You know, repented it. One of our great uh, you know, previs artists, and he just came up with this idea of the scratching the thing and the scratches being on the chest. Do you know what I didn't know it was Rapin? Yeah, huh? it was good. Because that's the other element, especially with a scene like this, mm -hmm. is not only it's not storyboards, you actually do what we call pre-vis, you actually do a cartoon version of it. Mm -hmm. And it has to be very precise because this is enormously complicated stuff to shoot. Some of it's pure visual effects, some it's the first unit, some it's the second unit. And everybody has to know exactly what they're doing. So, you know, I think we spent 18 months designing this end battle, you know, as a cartoon, ch making changes, timing it so it wasn't going to be endless and we wouldn't waste a lot of money shooting stuff that we couldn't use. And, you know, the more precise it got, you know, the clearer everybody was about what they had to do. And I'd never even heard of previs before. You know, I began on this film, but who could see? So that's the stunt you're talking that's about. That's right. Right. With Skander himself, and he had some wires holding him. Yeah, and he really did it. Yep. I know. It was, and the first time he did it, he slipped, and we all thought, "Oh no! <laughs> oh my God!" But he got straight up and did it again. Yeah. You know, and did it second time. Mm -hmm. It was a, a bad moment, but. Um, you know, this was a, a lot of work, a lot of thinking as well to get this battle to, to be interesting. And well, you know, despite all the previs and all of the preparation and all of the, the, the amount of the number of meetings and, and the spe specificity of how we were going to do it, we made changes in editing it until the very last yeah. minute. Because Tom Rothman, CEO at Fox, had a, had a terrific idea, you know, in, in and around this area here when the Grimace pulls him away from putting the seventh sword down, that we should then cut immediately to the white witch appearing. So you relate the, the mist to the witch. Right, that's right. And we didn't have it like that. We had it differently, but when we, we thought, this is pretty good. So we recut the sequence, and it did make much more sense like that. I'd like to point out that right here, we'll go back to Eustace as he is fighting the mist to get to the table. It was something we shot well after we finished the film. <laughs> And uh, Will Poulter had cut his hair short, so we hide it with the mist. Yeah. You can't quite see it, but if you look carefully, you might, you might see a frame or two of it. But and it also grown six inches. That's too. right. That's right. That was one of my dreads that the children would just grow during the course of the shooting, and I got so panic-stricken about Will's voice breaking halfway through the shoot that I actually pre-recorded his role, you know, with his voice as it was. But um, I was lucky; his voice didn't break till after we'd done. You know, on uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, at one point, we we needed to dub a Skander voice, and his bro voice had broken, and he didn't sound like himself. And we, at one point, even toyed with the idea of having his sister loop him, <laughs> which you can imagine how uh, how upsetting that would be to any 14 or 13-year-old <laughs> boy. We ended up, he was able to end up doing it, but I think maybe he was able to do it because he was threatened by the idea that yeah. his sister might. Yeah. So this is... The end, you know, the, 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 the sea serpent becomes the mist and the battle is over. And then these, again, at the MPCD, there's these just wonderful images of, I don't know how they did them, what their source references were, but these great shots of this cloud kind of disintegrating and the light coming through, you know, the, the, the battle is over. It's, it's, it's just beautiful work. Mm -hmm. But it's just amazing, when, especially when you look at the credits, how many people worked on this film? It, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that I'm sure the average audience member has no idea and no. probably is a little bored by, by all those names. But every last one, one of those names that you see on, on this film, had uh, each one of those people per, had a specific job to do and, uh, yeah. and uh, we're, in, we're indebted to them all. I mean, when I did the Bond film, I was very proud of myself that we had a crew of, of over 900, but I think on this film, I mean, we had a crew of about six or 700 in, in Australia, but in the last month of the film when we were finishing the visual effects and finishing the 3D, I reckon there were at least 2,000 people oh, yes, working I think on that's the true. film, working mm -hmm. in, they are working all over the world, in India, in London, in Toronto, everywhere. It was just amazing the amount of, you know, that work goes into it, the number of people. You know, so this is the payoff to, to Gail and all that reunited with her mother and 
again, that has resonance for... Now, these shots actually were done in real water, but they were yeah. done in a tank at yes. the studio. Yeah. We had our little tank to do, as you'll see on the other aspect of the DVD, when we did the, the boat, when we did the room being swamped. That was on a smaller tank, which we closed in, but the stuff of them swimming around and, and this sort of stuff was all done in a bigger tank in, uh, you know, in, in the uh, studios in Queensland. And I mean, you know, just the, just, I, I'm never amazed by the detail of Reaper Cheat. When, when he pops up here, just look at how wet his fur and right. just And look, we go underwater and see a little bit of him. I know, and there's a wonderful moment here when he actually gets on Eustace's yeah, shoulder to better, to better look at uh, yeah. uh, Aslan's country. And, um, you know, just the detail of it, I just think is astonishing. You know, how the, the, the care and attention that these animators put to it, it's wonderful. Well, we've come this far. And so here, this is a big challenge. Here we are at Aslan's country, so what's it going to be like? That's right. So we looked through all the films that have done, as it were, Heaven, From Heaven Can Wait to Contact and things like that. And, you know, this is our version of it. And this is a magnificent shot, but the, re the real shot, the, the only one we actually shot is a boat and about a 200 little lilies around That's it. Right. And fake, li fake lily, too. Fake lilies, yeah. And then the... Angus and his team of geniuses turned it into into this, this whole sea of lilies, which is just such a... It's an interesting um, dilemma that I think I would like to believe we solve very, very cleverly. The film is, in effect, the, the plot point, the action part, is over with. So we are now in clearly the home stretch, but we have a number of loose ends to tie up, most of them all character moments. So we have Caspian has to deal with his, his, his relationship with his father. We have to have, obviously, deal with um, Eustace and Reepicheep, and uh, each character has his or her final moment and final sort of come to terms with who, who they are and what their future is. And it really all takes place here in these last uh, five minutes. And this, you know, frankly, this is one of the most bizarre scenes I've ever shot. But before I talk about that, just this wave is just a brilliant piece of work. And I, I'm, I think I am true in saying that maybe two years ago you couldn't have done this. The technology is so advanced now to do this kind of the wave that never breaks. But, I mean, you were there. You remember it. It was That's just right. I made this decision, which was bold decision, that this whole last scene I would shoot on a real beach. And when we first showed up, we nearly got blown off it. You know, it, this was the last big scene in the movie. We shot it very early on in about the third week on a vast beach out, outside Queensland, which was deserted because it's a bird sanctuary. And I wanted the reality of the wind and their hair and all this. And on that first morning, I thought I made a horrible mistake. <laughs> we were going to come away for this or nothing. And of course, there was nothing. If you were watching us film this, there was nothing there. There was the sea, one side, and there was this beautiful beach. And then there was just these four actors, someone walking around with Aslan's head, and someone with a kind of little wire re Reaper Cheap. That's right. And an actor using Reaper Cheap's voice, as yeah. you mentioned earlier. And as you can see, it's very windy. Everybody's yeah. hair is blowing every which way compounded they were looking straight into the sun yeah. so we were able to cut around it but the poor actors it was quite a glare in their yeah. eyes and there's a lot of squinting and yet it's it's really it's a magic of movie making that you did the scene so early on it really as i say it caps each character's journey in this film and it's so nevertheless it's so emotional and if we were to show the audience the the dailies what we shot on a daily basis you wouldn't You'd never believe it would come to something yeah. like this. I think we've got a bit late, later on in one of the visual effects items on the thing. Oh, good. But, uh, you know, not only that, but, you know, Dante, it's very difficult for Dante to shoot this because the sun always has to keep in the same place. You can't have the sun moving around. So as the day went on, we would be turning more to, water to keep the sun behind us or in front of us, whatever it was. We'd be turning around all the time That's and then right. moving along, having to get rid of all the footprints so we could move to a fresh piece of... You know, we weren't like sat in one place for, for four days. We were moving all over the place. It was, and I have no idea to this day how 
you know, these actors turned in such an emotional performance. In those circumstances, it was bizarre. I mean, this stuff, you know, this, again, is the climax of the relationship between Eustace and Reepicheep, and it's, you know, so moving. And, you know, Will would go off on his own and uh, would get very upset and come back. And I said to his mother, what does he do? And he says, well, he just thinks of... He had a very sad time at one of his schools, and he likes to think of that, and it makes him cry. And <laughs> he comes back and, you know, uses that to get the emotion out of it. But, you know, again, for, this is a big moment for, for Georgie, you know, and again, she, all she was holding was some piece of fluff, you know, and yet, you know, look at the look on her face. It was the real thing. And look how well her fingers mesh into his fur. Yeah which was, that was brilliant, the way they do that. And all these things you take for granted and you only notice them if they're not done right. Right, that's exactly right. No one gives a round of applause for that because... But here you are, where you're right about Will. Will is reacting to basically nothing. Yeah. And uh, it's, he's quite emotional and it's, uh, it's really the, in many ways, the, the most significant relationship with the, in the yeah. film and it's really quite, quite touching. And Simon did very well, again, Simon yes. Pegg with this. And we, you know, we did have one or two goes at this. I mean, he, f he, he fell into the role very easily and, and skillfully. But to get that right amount of emotion from Reaper Cheap at the end, again, not for him to be whiny or self-pitying, but to know that he was going to a better place, but he was going to say goodbye to the world. I mean, that was, you know, that was tough. And uh, anyway, he, he nailed it. And the music is so great in this. Yes, you mentioned the music right. before, but this whole last 10 minute scene with all these themes coming together is a real triumph for him, for David. Because, I mean, you know, he's, I've used him a lot, and he's always in at the very beginning. I mean, I show him stuff, the first stuff we shoot. You know, I don't wait until it's cut. So right. he knows what's going on very early on, even if he's you know, in his case, about a year away from writing anything, he was seeing stuff all the time so he could get a sense of it, you know, get, get used to the language of the film and the tone of the film. Must learn to know me by. Now, this is an incredibly important moment because of Lucy saying goodbye to, to Ashland, <clears throat> who um, has, she was the first to discover um, in... Um, in, um, in, you know, in, in, in Lion the Witch, and she said this unique relationship with him because she was the youngest and, and the most innocent and allowed him into her heart. And now um, he's, he's made it clear that she's, she's, in effect, grown out of Narnia and gone, going into her own world right now and has to take what, what she's learned and, and indeed take his spirit with her into into her world. I mean, just as, you know, the Eustace Reaper Cheap is in some ways the emotional center, so her relationship with Aslan has been the emotional yes. center of the franchise. That's right. And again, you know, I mean, those next few moments that she pulled off, I mean, incredibly difficult to, to, to pitch it right, you know, not to overdo it, not to underdo it. And, you know, there she was, you know, just up against some piece of cloth, and you can't believe she's not you know, the emotion she manages to pour into it, it's, you know, it's just, just, these people are very gifted, I think, these actors. You were very, very lucky. And you, you really found, found Will, who was our... Uh, yeah, well, when Will walked in, we knew diamond. he was our boy, but, yeah. you know, it was early on, and who knew what was going to happen to us, but uh, we never, he had to wait a year between being cast and actually starting. That's right. I think he thought it would never happen, but... We were very lucky with him. And Aslan just made it clear to him that he may still have need of him, so we may yeah. see him, see uh, uh, Eustace and Narnia again. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the reverse of the opening sequence where, you know, we sank the, the, uh, sank the room into the water, and now in the reverse of this, we're pulling, we're, we're lifting the set out of the water. And this is, you know, this... The miracle of this smoking. is quite a uh, match cut. Yeah, because you see, there the water is uh, subsiding and they're completely dry. Yeah. So this was, I think, as Barry has talked about elsewhere on the DVD. You know, these two sets, a wet set and a, a dry set, so we had to perfectly match. That was the cut that really took us from, from you know, them wet to them dry. And this, you know, very 
touching end, and it, uh, this is the great skill of Rick Shane who cut it. We never touched this scene. He cut it first time. It's a very tricky little scene because there's just the piece of voiceover. They're just looking at each other. And we never touched it from the moment he first cut it. He just got it right, bang on. And the more mm -hmm. I look at mm -hmm. it, it's such a moving scene. Nothing is being said. They're just looking at each other. And he just got the whole timing of it and the rhythm of it right, you know. And I think it's such a powerful end. You know, it's just such wonderful piece of construction by C.S. Lewis mm -hmm. and by the film, you know, to take you back into the room and to put the picture back on. This is just a wonderful. It's so satisfying as a piece of... And for me, having been involved with these children and these, and these movies over th the course of three separate ones, it's particularly... Uh, um, melancholic moment in, in, in that, that we're they're not coming back to Narnia yeah and there you have it and, and then there's a dawn treader goes off into the uh, into the distance yeah and then we have our last contributor Carrie Underwood who wrote this terrific song yeah I mean you know. really wonderful song and, and I remember I said um, having seen this film and having this this is the first one in which all the the titles were at the end, and I thought, gee, after such a colorful adventure, are we really going to just have titles on black, you know, white on black? And I said, what what can we do that's really colorful and keeps the film, the spirit of the film, alive? And I and remember you directed me to Rick Shane, and Rick said, well, what about going to Pauline ba Bain's illustrations, who was a woman who illustrated all of the all of the books. And so here, lo and behold, here we are. And I had, um, I had said uh, we we need to recognize Pauline Baines because she died last year, and we somehow have to give give acknowledgement to what she did. And we've, I think we've, we've done the right thing by, on a lot of levels, but certainly by including her um, her wonderful illustrations into the uh, end credits. Yeah. Well, I was very pleased with the song. To go back to that because you know they can be dangerous they can be a pitfall yeah. and yet because you end the film very emotionally and then a song takes over and if the, if the song doesn't have the right tone to it it could be very jarring but i thought she did it yes very very well and already we know that she's been honored by the golden globe she's been right. so you know there are, there are a lot of people involved in this so at walden there's david Weil and before him carrie granite that were extremely helpful mm -hmm. and at Fox Tom Rothman and Elizabeth Gable and Rodney Farrell who also I yelled at on the set <laughs> but he was great he was with us a lot of the time with his notes no there are a lot of people it's, it's interesting you all with all of these names you're about to see there are so many more who really had yes, such Philip an impact Storer. on Philip the Philip Storer has been with oh, you on all of them that's right Jeff a fellow producer yeah. and, and uh, a great partner well, hopefully, uh, Michael and I have given you some insight to the film and uh, helped you enjoy enjoy what you've been seeing and watching, and and we've given you some of the tricks of the trade and some of our uh, our own personal uh, observations. And I realize I've talked way too much because I lost my voice in the middle of all this, but uh, thank you very much for hearing us out. Yeah, and I hope you enjoyed it. I think there's lots of good, interesting stuff on the DVD for those that want to get behind the mystery of it all, how it's all made, but I just want to thank Mark, because Mark's the reason I'm here. He gave me the job, so thank you, sir. Oh, you're quite welcome. I'm not sure that, that, I, that I deserve it, but thank you. It's been such a great uh, pleasure and partnership. We can be the kings and queens of it.